Hi, I'm Ryan Brando, the Artistic Director of Princeton Pro Musica. I'm here today with Jeff Dauma, Professor of Conducting at Yale and Director of the Yale College Glee Club. So, uh, Princeton Pro Musica is going to perform Von Williams' Don Nobis Pacem, uh, a cantata that brings together the texts uh, by Walt Whitman, a little bit of biblical text, and text from a speech given by John Bright to the House of Commons in Parliament. And uh, it draws on themes of warfare and uh, the, the ravaging effects of warfare, but also reconciliation. And I think this is one piece of so many that deal with music and war and sort of the way they they intersect. So, so I was wondering if you could give us just a really broad overview of music about war. I mean, from my perspective, it stretches way, way back. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the, if you start with the 20th century, a lot of the big choral orchestral works that um, have found a, a large audience and that continue to be performed do touch on, on the subject of war. Certainly this is one example, although Don Nobis Pachem wasn't particularly popular when it was first composed in 1936. Mm -hmm. It's right mm -hmm. before uh, England was going to enter the war, uh, fascism was on the rise, it seemed like war was sort of inevitable, and Vaughan Williams had, he was definitely a pacifist. He had served in World War I, Right. At the age of 41 or 42. Yeah, he in his 40s, it. right. And so he had first hand knowledge of you know, really horrific things that happen um, in a war. And so he, he got this commission and he decided that he was going to make a very strong anti war statement with this piece. And that was just maybe not the right time to do right. that in Great Britain. Um, but yeah, certainly this piece, Child of Our Time, The War Requiem, The Hindemith Requiem, all right. of these massive pieces from the 20th century. But to answer your original question, which was like, right. how does this start? There are a lot of musicologists who believe that the subject of war brings out a, an innovative streak in a lot of composers. And you could go back to Monteverdi, um, some of the earliest examples of uh, kind of uh, extended or experimental string techniques. Right. Uh, go Sound back to kind of music. Combattimenti. Right. Uh, one of the most popular chansons of the Renaissance era, Je ne can't right, right. Uh, which w was, I think, the source material for like 80 other pieces, and really like the most popular piece of its time. Uh, and it's, you know, I think nowadays people know it, or especially you know, Renaissance enthusiasts know it, but uh, you really can't overestimate how incredibly popular it was at the time. And then some of the finest. Uh, examples of mass settings from the late 18th century, early 19th century by Haydn and Beethoven, pieces like the Pauken Messe, right. Haydn, Lord Nelson Mass, and even the Misa Solemnis, Beethoven's kind of towering right. choral masterwork, um, all touched on the subject of war. Haydn was thinking about the Napoleonic Wars, which composed, you know, these are composed in the 1790s, and certainly for anybody living in Vienna, and Haydn's circle were the aristocracy. They were obviously very, very concerned about what was happening with Napoleon mm -hmm. and the French armies because it was their counterparts in France who were literally being beheaded. Um, so I mean, this was like, and, and the and, you know, like day you know, with each day, they get reports about the armies advancing closer and closer to Vienna. So, so when Haydn composed an Agnus Dei setting with these uh, distant warlike drums right. in the Pauken Mesa. That was a completely new thing to to comment on current events in a mass setting it had never been done before. Right. And uh, you know those pieces, the, the six late Haydn masses are are masterpieces for a lot of reasons, for a lot of purely musical reasons. But really, that's that's kind of the beginning of seeing the mass as a concert work and not just something with a strictly liturgical function. Right. And and Once so, it's freighted with sort of that extra musical weight. Right, right. Know. And that, so a generation later, with Beethoven and the Misa Solemnis, he's really kind of completing what Haydn started with those pieces and, and taking the mass out of the church and putting it in the concert hall. 
Yeah, and it, it strikes me thinking about the Pauken method that Dona Nobis Pachem, you know, in the third petition, uh, is not particularly serene. I mean, it's almost it's yeah. almost like a fanfare. It's 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 high and, and bright and and I thinking about putting that into a liturgical setting, mm -hmm. right? And thinking about what's going on at that point in a mass, it doesn't quite uh, seem to fit there. No, no, yeah, there are militaristic trumpet calls, right? And that you know that's something that. Haydn uses in his symphonies too, like in the drum roll symphony, sure. you know, these militaristic trumpet calls. So he's not saying, "Grant us peace" in a uh, like a metaphysical sense or in some kind of you know gentle uh, spiritual very, sense. Very real. The it's, army is marching it's, toward us. Yeah, it's he's talking. It's like like rallying the troops. Let's go. We're gonna you know we're you know we're gonna we're right. gonna win this, guys. That's right. definitely where he was coming from. And it 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 strikes me just that you brought up. Uh, extended techniques in the violin, and there's something about the sounds themselves, I think, that can pull us into the, the spirit of warfare, or uh, on the flip side of that, help us understand the sort of sweetness of peace. And I was thinking, in relation to this piece, just stretching all the way back to the, the earliest descriptions of just musical modes. You know, this collection of notes arranged in this particular way mm -hmm. can in, incite or can give one sort of martial militaristic fervor or strength, whereas perhaps this sound or this group of sounds uh, is much more related to serenity, that it goes all the way back, that just, just sounds themselves can pull us in one, one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. Because uh, thinking through a lot of these pieces that you've already, already mentioned, you know, composers have been using music to to celebrate military victory um, and to celebrate sort of arm, the signing of various uh, armistice uh, documents or treaties, mm -hmm. but then also to sort of whip up some fervor, as you've said. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that occurs to me in the Dona Nobis. Uh, on the one hand, in the, the second movement, beat, beat drums, the instruments are, are practically shrieking. I mean, Van Williams is, is able to, to marshal the orchestra to create some of those sounds mm -hmm. um, that I'm sure for the, the British public in, in the 20th century were, were very real and sort of terrorizing kinds of sounds. Yeah. Um, so we have the full battery of the drums and, and the brass, but then later on, um, in the fourth movement, the, those same instruments deliver one of the most sort of majestic beautiful fanfares in, in my mind, much of the choral orchestral literature. Um, so hearing two sides of, of that coin, I mean, you, there's something really visceral about it that, that uh, this music is able to, to tap into. Um, I wonder if I could ask you just a little bit about, about texts and particularly about Walt Whitman. Um, you know, Von Williams is not the only composer ever to have turned to Whitman for choral text, and the Dona Nobis Pachem is not the only piece he wrote that uses Whitman. That's right. Um, so I'm just wondering, what is it about Whitman? It, it's a good question. He was very popular in Europe um, in the late 19th century. His, his poetry was translated into German. I'm not quite sure when Vaughan Williams first encountered Whitman's poetry, but it goes back at least 30 years prior to this mm -hmm. piece. You find mm -hmm. the earliest set settings by Vaughan Williams in the in the first years of the 20th century. Um, I think pr for, for English composers around the time of World War I, it was frankly just because Whitman's war poetry, his Civil War poetry, right, right. was just the most um, the most emotional, uh, the most uh, insightful in the English language at that time. I would say I don't think any any other poet at that point had explored war as frankly um, and as personally as Whitman had. So people uh, like Vaughan Williams, who had experienced war's effects firsthand, I think they they just turned to Whitman as a voice for uh, things that they were feeling, things that they couldn't explain, um, and and of course. He's also Whitman, I think, just a genius. Yes. And one of there's also that. Yeah, I mean, he's just a he's just a phenomenal poet, and his his work still resonates.
today. Um, it's it, an interesting thing about the texts in this piece, you already mentioned that you have Whitman's poetry, you have a little bit of Latin, although it's not a whole lot, basically right. just on you say, don't know who's pachem, and then you have the angel of death speech um, from the period of the Crimean War in the 19th century. And that's another way that this piece is perhaps unique. Uh, of course, in the War Requiem, Benjamin Britten combines the text of the Requiem liturgy right. with the poetry of Wilfred Owen, poetry that dates from the time of World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, but this may be the first example of someone combining sacred Latin texts and secular English poetry in the same piece. Uh, every time I teach my class, uh, and actually, I, I, I usually include this piece not only in my class about music and war, but also in my 20th century core music survey. And I always tell the students, if you can find a piece earlier than this one that does the same thing, that mm -hmm. combines this you know, secular English poetry and Latin texts, please let me know, because I haven't found one, and nobody's ever been able to find one. Yeah. And usually the students are pretty smart and resourceful, so I, right. I think right. this may be the first example. And, Britain was not a big Vaughan Williams fan, mm -hmm. interestingly, for you know a wide range of reasons. Uh, but uh, I think it, he certainly would have known this piece, and I think it's very possible that that this piece had some influence on Britain when he chose to construct the War Requiem the way he did. Right. Even though I don't think you could really say there are a lot of musical parallels between this piece and that piece, but just the idea of it, the concept, I think, could have uh, could have been derived originally from this. From this yeah, it, 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 it really is an original project, I think, to rather than turn to a liturgical text, um, an extant liturgical text to use as a vehicle for a setting, to, as a composer, um, make the decision to build this collage mm -hmm. um, and, and extract just a few things here and there. Um, I'm very moved by the particular collection of, of pieces uh, of text that he pulls from the Bible in the sixth movement. Oh yeah. Um, and the way that those interface with the Whitman poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what he's been able to build is a, a piece about war, but not a piece about any one specific war. Right. You know, that it, that it does pull from um, the Crimean War period back in the 19th century. I think it it has his experience in World War One baked in it, mm -hmm. and I think it very much is looking forward to World War Two yeah. or anticipating uh, World War Two, and this this collage brings together um, some very intimate moments with I think some very large universal humanistic moments. Mm -hmm. So what strikes me. Uh, as a parallel between both this, between this and the War Requiem, are these moments where you hear a single soldier explain his moment of revelation that his enemy is just a man. Mm -hmm. the, the, one of the lines that uh, jumps out at me from the from the Von Williams is, "A man divine as myself mm -hmm. is dead." think of the moment in the War Requiem, um, again, we're, we're down sort of in the, the foxhole. Strange meeting. The, the, the strange meeting, right, that you, you come upon this person and are literally face to face. I bend down and draw near and see face to face the humanity of this person. I am the enemy you killed. I am the enemy you killed, exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's a, that is an interesting parallel, actually, because uh, you hear it in both cases by a solo baritone. Right. The stand in, right. obviously, for the soldier. For the soldier. And, yeah. and then, at the same time, at the, at the end of the piece of both the War Requiem and mm -hmm. the Dona Nobis, uh, the composers are able to zoom out uh, and, and give us a, a broader view, and they, they both develop this, this sort of slow, slowly building, sort of undulating 
texture in the strings and gradually the rest of the orchestra feathers in and the, the singers each feather in. And it feels so otherworldly compared to the rat tat tat of the second movement. Right. And that's where he says uh, what, what in the context of the rest of the piece sounds like the most um, amazing uh, idea, which is that nations shall not lift up a sword against nations, that that, that is the hardest goal to achieve, you know, mm -hmm. to be the bigger human, to yeah. lay down your weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I love the way that that works in both of these yeah. pieces. Yeah, the, the violent moments in the Dona Nobis Pacham are very effective. Beat, beat drums. I think you hear some of the influence of of Holst, maybe, that sure. the, the repetitive sure. rhythm that he uses in Mars, in the planets, which of course is a, another musical depiction of war, um, it, it is kind of paralleled in the, in the dig -a -dum, dig -a -dum, dig -a -dum, that, that is yeah. repeated in the second movement. Um, the In the Dirge for Two Veterans, which is kind of the other big, I don't know, militaristic, right. grandiose movement, right. I actually think that there, Von Williams is deliberately trying to be over the top. It's when it, when you hear, uh, I hear the great drums pounding. Okay. It's so massive, but we realize that what we're seeing here is a parade, and and, and actually a really sol solemn, somber occasion where the you know father and son are being brought back, and this poor woman has to see her fa her husband and her son coming back in caskets. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to believe that Vaughn Williams actually intended that moment to be literally grandiose. I think it's kind of maybe ironically grandiose right. or too grandiose, right. or grotesquely grandiose or something like that. Uh, but I think... And also that poem of the poems mm -hmm. wears its heart in its sleeve more than the others. Right, yeah. For me, as effective as those moments are, the best moments of the piece are the more lyrical moments. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like maybe Vaughn Williams is even more at home there in Reconciliation. Right. The incredible acapella setting of word overall. So gorgeous. And this moment that you describe, um, that if I had to choose my favorite moment in this piece, it would probably be that moment when, when the chorus begins, nation shall not lift up uh, a sword against nation. And this it comes after this um, stillness depicted in music, I think. Um, there's so much militaristic music elsewhere in the piece that that, that introduction um, by the strings, it just it kind of goes nowhere in terms of the harmony. Right, it's um, completely diatonic. And this is, what, I mean, Bon Williams is so good at that. Yes. He, he wants to show something just simple and beautiful, and he uses the white notes of the keyboard right. as just perfect. said it just kind of builds and builds and yeah and, and gradually other instruments join in and, and finally you have goodwill toward men uh, really the music of trying more, more like what happens in the palpin is right right yeah the, the end the ending is so spiritual <laughs> Succeeds is in the ver the very very end mm -hmm. that it's able to combine um, the the soprano who sings in Latin only also like the like the war yeah, exactly. as a foil to the sort of human baritone English speaker mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as this voice from afar or voice from above that um, that warns or that that just helps us see the, the, the bigger situation. Yeah. 
um, that it ends like the like the war requiem on a with a question mark in a way. Um, the the choir's final statement is is conclusive, uh, just a beautiful C major chord pachem, but then the soprano is the last thing we hear, just sort of hovering on the edge, uh, and I, I think that's a very skillful way to make to make the statement he's trying to make. We, uh, there are more pieces that follow, um, the War Requiem, obviously we've been talking about a lot today, um, and um, you mentioned a few others, and I wonder if you think that um, we have more to hear from this genre, from mm -hmm. big choral orchestral, because um, there are lots of pieces written in wartime or about war, yeah. I mean from pop tunes that become a radio hit, that people are hearing all the time. I think of something like um, Imagine, John, John Lennon, mm -hmm. or even something, this is from my youth, Bette Midler recorded from a distance during the Gulf <laughs> War. You know, and everybody heard that. Yeah. Um, so it has this really wide reach, but I, I don't think that it has the same effect mm -hmm. as several hundred people gathering to watch several hundred people Yep. make a communal effort. So there's a power there, but I, I wonder if we're going to continue to hear from composers. I, it's, a, it's a very good question, and I think, um, I'm not sure that, I mean, these pieces, most of the pieces we've been talking about, s stem from the, the two great wars, from World War I and World War II. And those were wars that touched everybody. Absolutely. If you lived in Great Britain, and France especially, but even in the United States, you know, either you were in the war, or a son, or a, s a husband, or a neighbor, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, someone very close to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you were directly affected, people you knew were directly affected. So there was a, a communal experience to this. And so these big communal pieces that require the participation of hundreds of performers seem like a natural reflection of what those people were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, even though we just passed, I think, the 12th anniversary of the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, right. we don't experience wars that way. In a daily lived No, way. And, and I mean, you could, you could debate the pros and cons or why that sure. is the case, but I think undeniably it's true. Most of us go about our daily lives. Many of us do not know personally someone who's actually fought in those wars. It's a very small segment of society that's impacted directly. So. And we also certainly aren't uh, aware of the sounds of warfare or, no. or you know, there were whole towns just leveled. Right. And that, that experience, it seems, it's too easy to put the historical distance between yourself and that. And this begins with Vietnam, really. You know, the World War I, World War II, this was the era of, you know, not only pieces like this, but uh, their physical equivalent, which were big war memorials mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. that you know you still see in virtually every town right. in this country, in, in throughout Europe, um, s uh, solemn, beautiful, grand right. uh, pillars, obelisks, you know, that, that pay tribute to the people who fought and died. Starting with Vietnam, the, the memorial is something very different, Myelin's memorial in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, which does not seem to celebrate the glory of war right. at all. Right. And, and now that the experience of war has become even more fragmented, I'm not sure. You know, the only piece I can think of in recent years that could be seen as maybe a descendant of this genre, I would say, is John Adams on the Transformation right. of Souls, which was a piece uh, composed a, a year after the September 11th attacks. And that piece, which is 
an amazing piece of music, mm. I think, is very fragmented. Right. It does not seem to make a strong political statement one way or the other, right? whereas Vaughn Williams' political statement is right on the surface. Right. Um, yeah, the Adams is, it's more of a, a, ref, a reflection, just a, a, yeah. a straight reflection. Yeah, which is a little bit like Myelin's Vietnam War Memorial, where right. you see your own reflection in the black right. stone. Right. So, yeah, he, just, he quotes, um, you know, things that were said during the attacks. He quotes a lot of notes that loved ones right. wrote looking for people who were lost right. after the bombing. Uh, and it's very moving, but there's no way he would have ended with you know, good will toward men. Or right. I mean, it, right. couldn't, it couldn't possibly. Right. And so, yeah, we're, I think we're in, a different, we're in a different place right now in terms of our collective experience to war and therefore the way that we represent it in our music, mm -hmm. in our art, in theater. Um, so, um, you know, who knows what will happen in the next... Yeah, my hope, my hope of course, is that war aside, the, the optics of large choral orchestral works and the experience of, of hearing them and, and being united uh, in, in the energy of them um, whether or not we're responding to war, will this kind of music will continue to draw us in mm -hmm. to our common humanity? Because those those experiences are harder to come by. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could you could have a large Skype gathering <laughs> of people who are nowhere near each other. So um, that I certainly hope we can learn from a performance of of a piece like this um, just how much we can be drawn together. Well, and I think the good news is that uh, certainly in the United States, uh, even if a piece exactly like this isn't being composed right now, uh, there's a lot of other great music that's being composed. Yes. And people, there are so many great choirs like your own that are, that are performing this music and keeping it, keeping it alive for audiences. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to do this um, and, and sharing um, all that you know about this this music and this relationship between music and war, um, I I know that this conversation will help me in my preparation, and I hope that it will help those who are coming to to hear it. Well, it's a pleasure. Great to have you back on campus. Great. Thank you.